there's seven billion people on this planet right now and there's only one of us but only one of us in all of creation and that really empowers us with some unique opportunities to cultivate and grow our uniqueness and create a life based on that without comparison to become our own champion in those areas that are important to us welcome to black belt beauty radio a podcast fueled by a passion to support your journey in developing your most beautiful and optimal performance in life each episode is driven with the intention to elevate your mind when we elevate our mind we elevate our life so get ready it's time to rise Hey everyone, welcome back to Black Belt Beauty Radio. I have an incredible episode to share with you guys today. I'm very excited about this. So my guest is Dr. Jeff Spencer. He is an astoundingly prolific man. He is an Olympic cyclist who's competed nine times in the Tour de France. He has a master's in sports science. He is a renowned chiropractor. He is a professional glass artist, painter, and sculptor. He is a published author. You guys, he has high performing in his DNA. So Dr. Jeff Spencer has worked as the corner man coaching some of the greatest leaders in business, sports, and entertainment, such as Sir Richard Branson, Tiger Woods, Lance Armstrong, and you too. He is the creator behind the Champion's Blueprint and the Goal Achievement Map. These are highly effective tools to develop peak performance and goal actualization. So we met through our mutual friend, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, and immediately we connected into a very meaningful, high-performing conversation. In that brief but very substance-filled meeting with him, I knew I had to get him on the show to share his incredible backstory, his powerful mental framework and perspectives that have not only helped to develop his own wealth of successes, but additionally, the successes of some of the highest-performing humans on Earth. So before I hit play, you guys, I have a few asks to support this podcast. If you love this episode, please throw it up on your IG stories and tag me. I'm at Roxy Look, R-O-X-Y. L-O-O-K, or Black Belt Beauty. You can tag both. And if you really want to support this podcast and throw love this way, you can leave a five-star review on iTunes. I read all of them, and I'm actually going to start sharing them on my IG stories as they come in. They definitely just inspire me, fuel my process. I mean, they, they fill my heart. So thank you so much in advance for all of you who are going to take the time to do that. And without further ado, I'm going to hit play and let you drop into this very inspiring and thought provoking conversation with Dr. Jeff Spencer. Enjoy. Jeff Spencer, Dr. Jeff Spencer, Jeff Spencer. I've been called, Hey, you, <laughs> by family, the corner man, corner Jim, man, Joe, badass, inspiring man. I mean, there What's are your so name again? Many ways to intro you, um, <laughs> all of which are so inspiring. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to have this time with you. I have been looking forward to it all month. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's <laughs> great precedent. <laughs> <laughs> well, even longer than that, because I think we met a month and a half ago now. Thank you to our friend, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Oh, she's a beauty, real gem. Oh my gosh, I love her so much. And, you know, I think we had like 20 minutes. Um, it was high intensity, though. It was, <laughs> we compressed several <laughs> so hours into 20 minutes. It was... <laughs> It was so good. You know, we went right into an epic conversation that I could have kept going with you on. And one thing that was so fun right <clears throat> off the bat was how you rolled up... <laughs> with your food and so did i and like i was saying love at first sight you know truly cause seriously that's always a, the one that's an initiation that's like a seal of approval really right <laughs> oh we're the same kind of people because that's always a standout for me it's like i always have my food with me you never know right it's, it's too risky it's too, too risky, risky. yeah and i just got to try your keto roll that you had with you that day that i didn't try that looks so good and i can say that I cannot wait to make this recipe at home. It's so good. Well, thank you. Yeah. So thank you so much for carving out time of your busy schedule. Easy to do. With me. Easy to do. Okay. So you are gnarly <clears throat> because you are so prolific. You are so accomplished. You have a body of work that is so incredible. There's so many places that I want to go with you and I'm notorious for rabbit holes. So I'm going to say Okay. <laughs> <laughs> When I feel our, us descending, I'll know Please. that we're en route, exactly. okay? <laughs> One thing that I want to ask you right off the bat is what does high performance mean to you? Well, high performance really is where you're performing at a level that you're 
capable of. And, and th that, of course, has different levels to it. But the thing that I tell my daughter, ever since we adopted her 10 years ago, even before, she didn't speak English, we didn't speak Spanish, as she was leaving to go to school, the last thing that I would always say to her when she left the door to go to school, I'd say, don't be average. And it's like, I, I, she didn't even know what that meant. That word meant nothing to her, but I wanted the neurons to become ingrained to the fact that this is a metronome that sits in the background that's always running. And to me, average is kind of the antithesis of high performance. And we all have our own high performance, whatever that is. And I do believe that we're here on this planet to manifest that. And we need to honor it because it is a gift for us that deserves to be cultivated and grown. Because when we are able to manifest our goals, it showcases to other people what's possible. And we need examples in this world of how do we get to next or how we, do we get to bigger Rather than a pontification, we need a living, breathing example that we can look at and we can trust that process. And that's why high performance is important to me. And that's my kind of operational definition. That's beautiful. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. So your dream to become an Olympian started at a very young age, right? You were, I think, seven? I was seven. Was seven years yeah, old? Yeah, I thought it'd be cool. <laughs> I did. How did that, wait, can we go <clears throat> there for a moment? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just... Did you feel like... So were you already very driven? First off, I was very athletic. Anything that involved jumping, running, bashing into people, throwing things. I mean, I was all in just because it was an exploration and it was part of my natural style and inclination. So yeah, and I, and I do have this self-start gene. I'll say that, you know, it's not that I'm hyperactive, ADHD, or inspired to create a monument to self to uh, draw attention to myself. But you know, my driver has always been that there's a big world that needs to be explored and i think that for me if you can answer the call as it's presented and my motivation has always been to explore the possibility you know it's not reckless it's responsible but it's not dismissive and it does honor insight in revelation and i'm completely okay with being subservient to something being presented to me for consideration. You know, it doesn't always have to be my idea. Yeah. So I, again, the self-starting gene really helps a lot in uh, my family because they were pretty much non-existent. Mm -hmm. There was no influence, either uh, supportive or not supportive. It was like neutral. And fortunately, I thought that was normal and I had the natural inclination and curiosity to pursue things. And I felt honor bound to follow the path and to uh, explore how far something could go for its own sake. I was never like an angry athlete that I'm going to show you guys you're wrong because you told me I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. I'd never been motivated by that or out of fear of lack and I'll do something now that I think I need later because I'm afraid of later. So I'll prepare for it now so I'm not the guy left standing in the musical chairs game. I, <laughs> I've never been motivated by that. It's an exploration, but it's not self-serving. You know, it's mm -hmm. showing up for the calling. So I... I don't know if I've articulated that well, but that's, no, that's kind of good. the way that I feel that I've always done it. And what I found is that, you know, my life has been a bit effortless in one sense because I haven't labored under the severe pressure to determine next mm -hmm. or to be responsible for a now that maybe isn't appropriate for myself. So I've been able to conserve a lot of life energy and substance over time, but I've certainly, to become an Olympian, some of the other stuff I've done has required amazing dedication that came easy to me, and I always had the energy to do it. It came easy to you. That's amazing. Well, let me, let me put it this way. Now that I say that, it, yeah. it was presented to me, and I engaged it mm -hmm. because I saw it as a possibility, and I didn't discard it by first face value, but mm -hmm. I considered it, and if the gravity was there... And I felt I was called and drawn to it. Mm -hmm. Kind of hard to articulate that, but yeah. then I was kind of all in, and it was easy to show up and go all in. It's all about going all in, right? I say that a lot. I, I do, because I, I mean, I think that you know, going all in at the right time is appropriate because generally we can achieve what's just outside our reach. We just haven't done it yet. Right. And I feel that just because we're human, we all share some similarity and that we all have a lack of confidence in self at some level. Yeah. 
And based on that, then we kind of intellectually determine what our ceiling is. And I don't think that's correct. I think you don't decide that in advance. You test it against the merits of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity will tell you where your limits are. And to me, when you know your limits, they can be broken or transcended, but then you at least know yourself and what you need to tool up for. But if you never test the edges, then you have a low grade level of anxiety that's always there haunting you because you're not testing yourself against anything. You're playing it safe. That's badass. Yeah, and there's a big mythology about this. You know, people think, well, I need to be fear free. Well, you know, you don't. Who came up with that? Right. You I know, it's like so discrediting. It, 100% it is. Yeah, and it's, it's a complete myth. Yeah. So, really, you know, people that live a fear free life, I mean, the truth is, is that, as I was telling you know, one of my clients that won two gold medals in the Olympics, I said that you're fear free, you're living life too much in the safe zone. Yeah. It's like, you know, come on now, let's be real. You right. know, unless you scare yourself periodically by, deliberate intention you're not out there defining yourself enough i totally agree you know? with that yeah i was one of the things I, I knew off the top of my head i wanted to ask you is how do you work <clears throat> through fear because you're the corner man to yeah and you've been to some of the most elite high performers in the world right and you know that means that there's an incredible level of trust right they have mm -hmm. to trust you and your mindset and your ability to you know maneuver them through challenge and help them succeed these kind of next level versions of themselves the fullest expression of themselves how do you work through fear well first of all I, I recognize that you know i have two mindsets working concurrently within me as a human as we all do that makes up our human nature we have a human mindset that's our fear-based survival instincts it's our default beliefs that are calibrated towards survival which is our most primal instinct and it's our biology because it's survival based, it's high speed, it's faster than we can think. I mean, I think everybody said something that they wondered where that came from and the harm that it did could in some instances be irreversible, but yet it was intentional. Where did that come from? It came from your survival instincts. Yeah. So we do have a high speed biology there that I think is, is obvious. And because it's survival based, it gets first dibs at our life. It's the primary filter that every moment runs through. but. It, it can only repeat history, it can't make it. And if we live life through that, then you're destined to a life of mediocrity, impulsive decisions, and uh, frustration because you cannot achieve goals consistently and you can't achieve aspirational goals because it won't let you. But we have another side, which is our innate wisdom that we do have, which I call our champion's mindset that I think is equally, if not more evident and has a bigger say but because it's based on excellence not survival it doesn't get first dibs but it does have final say and we have to apply those things that history has shown and the champions in every discipline have demonstrated to be true that may be contrarian to the way most people look at it but you know for me that's the distinction between do you want to be a natural human being and do you want to come from human nature well that's okay, but not for me. You know, I want to come from my champion's nature to create a life of excellence, to call people to a higher game, and to honor, you know, my life opportunity. Yeah. And so I have to apply that every day. And it's like I know that. So I don't look at the other thing about fear that I think is really critical is that a human mindset concept that sounds real, but it's complete mythology is that you need to be fear free to take action. And you don't. You have to know what to do. And you, take action to my definition in my program the goal achievement roadmap it's like courage is taking action despite your survival impulses you I just need that. yeah you just need to know what that is so basically you don't need to be fearless you can have your fear but know what you're doing as yes. you're stepping into. yeah yeah and that's part of the therapy you know yeah. if we wait for fear to dissipate we'll be waiting forever and that's part of human nature's trick because our fear-based survival instincts don't want us to succeed because that's not what they're about yeah. It's about impulse survival. Yeah. And it could care less about Olympic gold medals or a life of excellence and contribution. Yeah. Because that's not what it's about. Yeah. It's so and so true. it's easy to get trapped in that belief because, you know, we're told by everybody, go with your first instinct. Mm. And I'm saying, I'm not sure about that because the first impulse is really fear based. That's so smart that you put you know? it that way. It's so true. I, just to really amplify what you're saying, the other day I was walking out to, I do 10Ks in the sand um, a couple times a week. And, you know, I had blisters on my feet. It was midday. It was super hot. And I was walking to the beach knowing that, okay, this is going to be very uncomfortable. And, you know, as someone who's been writing the majority of my life, I'm very self-aware and self-connected. And I'm just 
now I'm able to observe my thoughts. And my immediate thoughts that started to come to me were, you know, you don't have to run a 10K. You know, you could just walk. You have blisters on your feet. You could just... And I was fascinated because I'm like, wow, look at the brain right now. It senses that I'm about to get uncomfortable. And so what is it trying to do? It's trying to keep me from going towards Mm -hmm. the challenge. And I'm laughing because I'm watching the thoughts. And if anything, I'm being fueled by this because I'm like, you're not going to win. So I feel like this is the champion mindset, or hopefully, you know, that's allowing me to push away the human mindset. Which is true because the human mindset gets first dibs. That's biology. You can't help that. We can't shut it off. It's on 24 hours a day. The battle between the two is for control of our decision making, and it's with us every waking moment for every day of our life. Yeah. And if we recognize that, then we don't feel like we have to overcome it to supersede it. We right. just have to apply what has to go right to manage it while we stuff it into the background by pulling the champions program up and putting it into the foreground on the desktop. Yeah. And it's something that we acquire and we maintain you know, through its vigilant application. Yeah, that's uh, amazing. That's why everybody always drifts back. You know, you can't outrun the human nature that we have that's the default that you can't turn off. Right. We never sort of get there. You know, it's acquired and maintained through its application. Yeah. I feel like that moment just validates so much of what you were just saying. I had to bring it into the picture. Goal achievement roadmap. Let's dive into this. One of my favorite subjects. So good. Thank you. (laughs) Number one starts with clarity. So can we go through the dial? We can. I just like to sort of say what my uh, experience was in the high performance world is that I realized that the way that most people pursued their goals, they had a, a big, hairy, audacious goal that they were told to have huge goals, bigger the better, moonshots, detailed plan, and then outwork everybody. And that's what would close the gap between where we are and where we want to go. And I call that the gap model. The gap is this elusive hole, this space that's empty, void between us and the goal. You work hard, you stay vigilant, you don't give up, you remain positive, you think good thoughts, you believe, then you try harder, you believe a little bit more. And with that, everything will backfill, then you'll achieve your goal. And I found that that recipe sounds right. It seems like if we try hard and we have a great plan and it's detailed that we should get to where we want to go. But that's not what history tells us. To me, most people have a goal of frustration. 90% of all the people that I know know that they're capable of more. They want more, but they can't get to more based upon what they do. And they may be doing what all the experts say, but they can't move the needle. Yeah. And that's because, you know, in that model, in my opinion, from what I've observed, it's ubiquitous. It's the mantra, but it, it can't deliver. And so I looked at what I was doing with my clients and I realized, well, the gap, the hole isn't empty. What sits in that space is a two-part process. Mm -hmm. Each of those parts has got five steps that I call the goal achievement roadmap, meaning that we take the goal that we're considering pursuing, and then we look at the first part of this, which is preparation. How do we prepare to pursue this goal? Mm -hmm. And there are five steps. You get goal clarity because it gives you goal focus. You look at your motives because it gives you drive. You look at the impact of your achieved goal on yourself, others, the world around you, your legacy. That gives you purpose. We're still in preparation. We're not even pursuing it yet. And then we look at mindset. Do I have the mindset to do this? Mindset gives us courage. And then we look at our resources. Do we have the time, the talent, the team, the materials, the roadmap, et cetera, to actually do this? And when we've gone through a correct preparation, then we trust our preparation when we trust our resources. That's Step number one, not step number one, but division number one. Yeah. We've got to prepare first. Yeah. That's what the champions do. Preparing means that you're ready to begin the journey. You have jungle fitness before you go into the jungle. Right. The jungle's dangerous. (laughs) You can get hurt in the jungle. Most people go into the jungle without any preparation. Right. And then when they find out that they're lost, then they look for the map and they don't have it because there was no preparation. Right. So the second half is performance. First you prepare, then you perform. Performance is actually the path that you take pursuing your goal. Mm -hmm. And there are five parts to this. This is where we kind of start the process. And we must have a deliberate starting procedure that gains its initial traction. If we don't have that, then we can trip out of the gate, which is bad for everybody. Right. You may not get momentum back. You may lose all credibility. 
you have to have a first measurable sign of goal progress that you achieve first that confirms that your preparation was correct and it mobilizes team. Then the next step is the honeymoon. Mm. This is where we're all excited because we have some indicators that this is actually gonna work. And this is where people oftentimes go out, especially startups, and they overspend. Yeah. And they get laxed on policy. They don't look at their schedules. Then things start to disintegrate prematurely. Mm -hmm. And everybody panics. And what do we know about all honeymoons? They yeah. all wore off. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like go away. Right. So right. when we get to that point where it's not fun anymore and we're just getting started, yeah. that's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. But most people think drop in motivation means that wrong plan, I can't do this, wrong team. Right. They misinterpret it. Yeah. And then they quit prematurely, which is tragic. Mm -hmm. So the idea would be to have a reality check where there's a recalibration. Mm -hmm. And then the third step while you're pursuing your goal itself is what's called the daily grind. Mm. And I think we can all recognize that. It's what it sounds like where we're putting all this time and effort into it. And we're not getting anything close back to what we think we deserve from the time and effort. Yeah. It's like, man, this sucks. You know, I don't know if I want to really want to do this because, yeah. you know, I've got a little resources left. I don't see any progress. I'm not feeling good. I got battle fatigue. I'm tired. You know, my team's on edge. People are starting to backbite each other. Yeah. This is looking pretty grim. Maybe I should get out. Well, you know, you actually may be one step away from your breakout. But if you know that the daily grind is supposed to happen and you know how to stay in the game, you know how to recognize it, you know how to prepare your team for it to get through it, yeah. then the team stays together. They have that one next step and then one day they get up and they believe that they can do it. That's a right. major milestone. Yeah. You know what it's like where you're struggling, you're fighting day in and day out and all of a sudden you get up, hey, you know what, I can do this. Right. That's the promise. Yeah. But yeah. mostly people quit before that time. They misread and interpret the circumstances. And because essentially there was not effective preparation Prior. Well, that generally leads to it. Yeah. And again, a lot of people don't prepare well yeah. for, for several reasons. Number one, they think, well, unless I get going on this right now, somebody's going to button line and steal my idea. So true. You know, and so yeah. what happens because they're not prepared, they stall early. Yeah. And then whoever is there now already knows about it. Now they get passed up or they think that their lack of faith that the universe will provide for them. It's a breach of that if you don't just dive in and the universe won't reward you because you didn't display the faith that was required. Sure. Complete mythology. Yeah. Complete mythology, but I see it all the time. Mm -hmm. And so lack of preparation can lead to that, but it also really leading, misinterpreting circumstances. People sure. think, well, this is really difficult, therefore it was bad management and poor planning. And I did this because I chose it on the other side or, you know, I swore the other day, so therefore I drew bad stuff into my life. Right. Which isn't true either. Like, the daily grind is part of every significant goal. You Absolutely. just ha you have to expect it. Right. And you got to know how to deal with it. Yeah. Be and resilient. you have to prepare your team for it. Like, how do we know we're in it? What do we do when we're in it to get out of it? Just the two other steps when you're performing. This is boots on the ground. This is live ammo. This mm -hmm. is where blood flows. Yeah. This is the real deal. This isn't preparation. This is the real thing. Yeah. If you get through the daily grind, then the ninth step in the 10 step process is where you have to go from knowing, believing you can do it to knowing you can do it. Huge difference. Belief is, I think I can do this. I have faith I can, but there's still some doubt. Right. Knowing is I'm confident and certain I can achieve the goal because I've demonstrated something that has showed me and team that we can do this. And that's called a breakout. That's huge. Yeah, and we have to name that. Right. And that's a purposeful part of what we need to do at a certain point in the goal achievement process. Yeah. And if you get to knowing, it's literally game over because you know you can do it. Once you know you can do it, I think we've all had that experience where, you know what, I can do this. Right. This is over. I, I'm going to make this happen. And it's almost like the preceding eight steps are all geared towards creating breakout where you go from the belief to knowing. But there's one last opportunity to screw it up. And that's where once you know that you can do it, one final step, which is finish, that's where we can rush to the finish line to get there quickly so nobody cuts in line or we don't botch it. Just imagine you're, you're in an airplane and you're at the end of the journey and you hear the pilot say, we're on our final approach. Does the pilot slow down or does he speed up to get on the runway faster? What does he do? He slows down. 
Because the idea is let's get on the ground safely because right. we know we can make it. Right. So why are we rushing and tripping at the last second? Because if you don't finish, you don't win. Right. And so I think a lot of the mythology of goal achievement, certainly, you know, my program answers all of it through the 50 years of experience that I've had in business, sports, and entertainment. And a lot of our decision making is based upon mythology and what we think it is or what's been recited enough for us to believe it, but it's not true at all. So I feel like most of the problems that we inherit are preventable, but we need a roadmap that is our true serum against our presumptions that we believe to be true that aren't. It holds us accountable for being ready and not starting before we're ready. Or let's take the reverse of that, starting when we're taking too long to get ready and we still think we need to read another book or another course. We still haven't started yet, but we're just getting there. So, yeah, we need something like that that's historically based that gives us indicators that have proven themselves throughout history to advance us towards our goal achievement. It's so powerful and what's so cool is that, you, you know, it's really refreshing to hear all of this. It's mythology. And I think that one of the most incredible things about you know, what you have been creating, what, you know, the goal achievement roadmap, among so many other things, champion mindset, champion blueprint. The thing is, I think what you're doing is you're making it very possible for people to realize that they can, first of all, accomplish great things and mm -hmm. then actually be able to execute, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that's, you know, both of those are so important. First, you have to be able to see it, right? You have to have the vision, believe that it's possible, and then you need a sound plan. And that's usually, I think, I don't know actually what's harder. <laughs> well, it's actually that the, the biggest, should I say, myth of all is that goal setting leads to goal achievement. Mm. Yeah. It isn't. Goal setting is like setting a target. Yeah. But there's another side to this is that there's all sorts of goals out there. There's impulsive goals, there's premature goals, there's big, hairy, audacious goals, there's moonshots, moon there's smart goals. But, you know, people that I know, they want the right goal. Yeah. Because when we have the right goal, we have an alignment in our mind, body, and soul that is committed to the goal because it understands the goal, because it's gone through a rigorous process, a goal selection and vetting yeah. that's confirmed that it is the right goal and in my experience most people they choose a goal but they're more focused on the outcome that it's going to bring to them than a relationship with the goal itself in holding the goal itself sacred by developing a relationship with it so i created a what i call the right goal criteria where we're actually taking our proposed goal that we're considering pursuing mm -hmm which I call a provisional goal, meaning that, hold on, it, it's a candidate right now, but l let's vet this against the right goal criteria to let's make sure that this really is the right goal. So each of the letters in right stands for something that we have to defend. Like, is this goal relevant to me? If so, how? And is it relevant enough for me, for my mind, body, and soul to align with it? That's an important question. Very. Totally. I love that you incorporate heart, body, and soul. I mean, you're really looking at it from a 360 perspective, Correct. which I think that's the power right there. And Correct. It's usually very one-dimensional. Correct. And one-dimensional goals, when they get tough, you start thinking about running for the exit. 100%. Because you, you can't defend that which you're not in alignment with. You're relying on what it's going to give you is the motivation. But the relationship to me, and that's why we have to really confirm that it is relevant enough for us. It doesn't have to be perfect, yeah. but is it enough? And also the I in right is indicators. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the indicators that tell me that this is the right goal for my mind? Mm -hmm. Is it big enough? Is it a challenging enough? Or is it narcoleptic? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Yeah, and if totally. it's underwhelming, well, maybe you don't want to think about it, but let's be honest about it. Right. And if it's highly exciting, but it doesn't scare you, mm -hmm. then, okay, we're in the sweet spot. Yeah, it is up for consideration. What about the body? Right. Does your body really want to go through this? I mean, you know, I went to a Tour de France once, and I knew I was going to sleep three hours a night for a month. You know, and I got the call to go two weeks before, and I was already dead from doing something. And, you know, my body needed to vote on the goal, which it will. And we experience how our mind, body, and soul vote by a level of preoccupation or restlessness mm -hmm. is the extent of our alignment. When we have enough alignment, then we have tranquility, purpose, we're energized. 
when we're kind of neutral and ambivalent, then we're kind of pulled between, yeah, I want to do it, but I'm not sure, I'm restless, I don't know. But then there's emergency brake, red light, don't even think about it. So I, th I think that we do need, like the indicators, mind, body, and soul. Is this enough for the mind? Is this enough for the body? Too hard, too little, too right. long. The soul, is there enough uh, humanity in this for me? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. And I think we really have to ask that question. Yeah, you know, I agree with you. And then we look at the uh, more numerical, the tangible side of the uh, experiences and the benefits as well. And then the G and right is gravity. You know, how are you emotionally connected to the goal? Where's the gravity here? Plays a big role in the H and right is height. Is this big enough for you? Mm -hmm. Not to discourage you. Yeah. But let's be real. I mean, I've had people come to me and say, you know, I'm supposed to know my moonshot because that's what everybody's talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to know it. I can't even think or even go there. You know, do I want to last on an asteroid and mine it for trillions of dollars of minerals? <laughs> well, somebody said that. Well, yeah, but I don't know if I can do that. Yeah. And even some of the brightest students on the planet, I did this deal last year in, uh, in Massachusetts for the 4,000 you know, top scholastic high schoolers in the nation. I mean, some of these people, they skip like five steps, you know, if they're 13 and they're a senior in college. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. And right. it, the number one question they all ask me is like, look, everybody's putting all this pressure on me. What am I going to write? What am I going to do? Yeah. You know, and I tell them what I'm going to do and it, but I don't know how to do it. How do I, how do I actually achieve this? Yeah. So goal setting is not goal achievement. And that's so important, too, you know? because how many people, I mean, New Year's resolution, people are always setting goals, right? And yeah. I think one of the most difficult things is when people don't accomplish the goals. And now, for whatever reason, all kinds of reasons, they're not set up to really, you know, to, to finish, to execute, to accomplish. And then now guilt comes in. Now they feel like they can't. And all this. Correct. It's such a snowball, of, it, it, a downward spiral. And it, I think in everything that you're saying, it just goes to show that this is preventable. You know, most of the problems are preventable. Yeah. It's just the mythology is so deeply steeped yeah. and promoted. And I mean, a lot of people think, well, you know, the experts are right. I'm doing what they say. Yeah. But goal setting is not goal achievement. I mean, the idea is, okay, so if we set this giant goal, then that's where everything starts and everything backfills from that. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Well, not really. I mean, that's just your goal. We don't even know if it's the right goal. So or huge. yeah, and if, if we follow the gap model, correct? Yeah. Well, we don't even know what's in the gap. Right. So how do you mount a defense against the gap, and how do you avoid what's in there if you don't even know what's in there? Right. It's so so true. I just, and, you, and you can't even enjoy the journey as much, right? No, because you're on edge all the time. You don't right. know when you're going to walk off a cliff. Right. I mean, seri <laughs> seriously. So true. Seri seriously. And you want to enjoy the journey because then you can extract all the. <laughs> Things that you know are gonna allow you to become a fuller expression to not only achieve the goal, right? Because then, because I don't ever think it's just about the goal. I think it's absolutely about the journey and who you are becoming all absolutely the way to is. the goal, right? Because let's just say we're prepared, we've finished the goal. We're already looking at the next goal, right? Yes, you should be actually. You should be right. Yeah, yes. So it's really, I think for me, it's you know, I really look at it like, well, who are you on the way there? Who are you becoming? And being so constantly connected and aware <clears throat> of that is so important too. It, it really is. And kind of add to something that you just said there that like, when we're talking about the journey, well, what is the journey? Can I name even where I am on the journey? No, you can't. Because a goal ambition or a spreadsheet, that's not a map. It shows you a level of performance, but the whole reason why I created a graphic that you can look at, you can see the two parts, preparation and performance, and you can see the five steps in each, then you can actually name where you are. Would you ever go on a vacation without looking at a roadmap and saying, we're here, and this is where we're headed, and this is the route that we're going to take, and this is what we should expect en route. We know it's behind. We know it's ahead. Right. We know where the booby traps are, and we know <laughs> what the smoothest route is. Right. You would never do that. But in goal setting, that's not what people do. It's right. just a big idea, and you push harder. You don't give up. You stay in the game. You stay motivated. You be positive, and you believe. Right. Right. And a lot of people, they're stuck in belief, and they're still waiting, and they just think that if they believe more, they're going to get there, and you're not going to. Or you just work harder, but you're not necessarily being effective. Right, or, because yeah. what, what, are you, what are you working harder against? Exactly. What's, it, it, so again, I, there needs to be a reference that you can defer to where you can name where you are. Yeah. I'm in Division One preparation, mm -hmm. and I'm now building my resources. I'm specifically working on assembling my team. 
Right. We haven't even started yet. I'm not in performance yet. Mm -hmm. So this is a way of doing that. So automatically, if you can name it, your anxiety drops. It's like being ill and sick. You know, if you don't know the diagnosis, then you got you know every terminal illness on so earth true. and so you're freaked out but if somebody tells you you got conchus of the bonkus then all of a sudden <laughs> so oh i feel true. so much better yeah, it's i feel so, so much better the unknown and uncertainty is what i think freaks most people out absolutely world, you know yes so yeah that's the thing you you're such a strategist it's incredible i mean i gotta ask you even just for my own personal how did you come up with these things because it's incredible to be you know it's you have the mind of an engineer is really how I receive you because mm -hmm. you know it's not just that you you're an Olympian Tour de France nine times was it nine times yeah yeah I mean all the incredible people that you corner in, but to come up with these systems is incredible in of itself can we talk a little bit about that? yeah I, I would love to yeah. I've always been like this ever since I was a little kid I was curious because you know when I had Olympic fever I noticed that there were athletes that could and should win and they did and there were athletes that should have won and didn't there were athletes that shouldn't have won and did so i knew it wasn't about the person but it was really something that was elusive to me that i wasn't quite sure what that was mm -hmm. but i've always had a mind that kind of looks at at any point in time of the context in its entirety taken as a whole there's always one best action that can move us forward mm -hmm. and also i guess another way that i look at this is that if i talk with somebody I kind of look at them as a composite of their personal and their professional life mm -hmm. and that creates a single entity them mm -hmm. and the way they think historically and presently and their decision making is a force on that composite that's pushing it forward yeah and then there are, are external forces acting on it geopolitical economic etc that are influencing the trajectory mm -hmm. and i could tell the trajectory from just a simple conversation with someone and i know where it's going to land in its entirety but it takes a while to get there. You know, it's like, I'm 68. I don't know what 68 is supposed to look like or feel like, but, <laughs> I you know. That you said I'm 41. I, I, I have no idea. I, I have no idea. <laughs> but, you, you know, with enough scar tissue, you've been through a full life pass once. Yeah. And then you start to see everything for second, third, and fourth, and fifth time. And then you really start to understand the entirety of the universe of the life experience. Mm -hmm. And at that point, then you can step into an advisory role where... You're at 100,000 feet looking down on the universe of the individual or the team or the organization, and you can make judgments against the whole in terms of the impact of the parts and how they're assembled. I think you need to get to a certain point to do that. Sure. Before that, you can learn it, but you don't own it, mm -hmm. and you can't see the nuances. Or you can be a specialist in a particular area. Like, let me show you how to do a give a good business meeting or to create a great LinkedIn page. I mean, those are skills and necessary, mm -hmm. but there's kind of a, a reading of the tea leaves that is the context of the reality as it currently is in real time mm -hmm. that needs to be looked at, in my opinion, so that every choice is made against the impact against the whole over time. I love that. You know, and yeah. that's what I do with my clients. So, good choice today that hurts you tomorrow it's a bad choice right you know business that hurts personal personal hurts business bad choices so i've always been like this don't ask me why but i just kind run of downloaded that way. i don't know yeah i don't know why it's like all the data goes through the filter and i know the answer like almost immediately i don't i have no idea why that is okay. but i can kind of see that all of this means that yeah and because it means that then we do this right that's and cool. yeah, over time, you know, I've been able to craft out my model based on that because of the consistency of it. Yeah. So uh, there are some things that we can be absolutely certain of that history tells us. Well, something that was so cool that stood out to me in your bio, you said something like, I actually want to pull it up because it's that good. Okay. So as an Olympic athlete, it was against you at the highest level. I trained my body like a gladiator and my mind like a mathematician. To this day, I still possess that mindset and relationship with my body. So... I love this. You know, remember when I when we met and I told you I'm a logophile. <laughs> <laughs> you did. You told me that. It's impressive, by the way. But you know, the part where it's so perfect to me, train your body like a gladiator and your mind like a mathematician. So everything that you just said, I don't know how I 
do it, but this is just how I do it. Or, yeah. you know, and how I say that, you know, I really receive you as like, you have this engineer mindset, you know, and you're able to really systemize things that are not easy. I don't feel like this just comes natural to people. So that, you, you know, you kind of said it right there too, like the mathematician mindset and that you're still going through your life um, yeah. from, which is amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. that, that, that is true. It, like this may sound really weird, and if, weird. Okay, well then we're in the right. You're in the right place. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's what Bono told me the first time I worked with them. We got done doing some stuff before a concert, and he jumped off the table and he said, "Strange." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Well, I specialize in strange." Yay! And he said, "Well, you're in the right place then." <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Is that funny? <laughs> oh my gosh! That's Isn't that funny? So great. Isn't that funny? So this is the only way I can say it is that like when I'm talking with an individual or a team, my first task is to get a full purge of all the variables that make up their universe. And every time they tell me something, if you can kind of imagine that it, it's shaping a piece of clay, everything they say is shifting the clay. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the conversation, the, the clay has got a set form. Mm -hmm. And that form tells me the story. I don't know how to explain it. I think that's beautiful. But I see it and I know exactly what this means. Mm -hmm. And because it means this and this is what we do, I'm never going to tell you, you got five choices and whichever one you want to follow, I'll support you on that. Yeah. I would never say that. Yeah. I would say, all things considered, one choice, this is it. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's really powerful. So. My mind just went into artist mode from a few things that you just said. Because <laughs> yeah. you're, yeah, sculpting. So you are an artist. You've yes. been an artist for the majority of your life as well, right? Which I think is... Yeah, I started when I was 18. I made my formal art career, yeah. And it, um, I actually is hot glass sculpture. Yes. And I was uh, lucky enough to be an apprentice to a, a master of a brand new whole level of technique. But a couple things I like to say, I think that this is really significant, is that he chose me, and I only had an athletic background. I had no artistic background, but I met him through a cinematographer and editor for a movie about his creative philosophy that he won an Emmy for. And he said, I haven't yet found somebody that I can pass my techniques onto. It just hasn't occurred yet. And I knew that that was me. I don't know how to explain that, but I knew that it was me. And I asked my uh, neighbor who did the film that was showing us the film mm -hmm. when he said that and we went and called him up that instant and I told him I don't know why I'm calling you but I saw this in your movie and he said you're the guy I've been waiting for so let's get started tomorrow and so what that did for me I knew I had artistic potential because my father was an artistic genius even though it wasn't manifesting it but when I was helping my mentor craft his masterpieces i was developing my own skill but when we took lunch breaks and things like that he would play classical music mm -hmm. he would uh, read to me the poets and the philosophers and he said i need to fill you up on this and it's like i had the capacity to embrace it mm -hmm. and absorb it and be nurtured by it you know, and I came from a welfare family. Last time I saw my dad when I was 13. And again, he saw something that I had the capacity to embrace. And that meant a lot to me because it developed a latent side of me that had the capacity, but there was certainly no vehicle being on welfare, a uh, single mother, you know, not the best of stuff, yeah. which wasn't a problem to me. But And then my Olympic coach who helped me become a, an Olympian. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a three-time Olympian, four, five-time national champion. But again, he taught me to be a thinking, thoughtful, complete and comprehensive person who happened to be an athlete. And that crafted different parts of me that were essential for teasing out all parts of me that taken as a whole would give me the chance to play at my full potential, even though some things may not seem related to athletics. They contributed certain micro percentages that at that level do make the difference and i was really fortunate to have the blessing of that intervention at times where i was receptive but i couldn't give it to myself sure you know and certainly no one wins alone and we need that level of support but an important lesson here is that 
when we develop the entirety of us as a human and all of its elements, it makes us better at all the compartments. I agree. You're going to be a much better athlete if you're a good student. You're going to be a much better student if you cultivate a hobby. Sure. I mean, all of these things facilitate each other because we're seeing things in a different way. Yeah that's slightly different than traditional or what it appears what the path appears to be to bigger better faster stronger whatever that is absolutely i think everything affects everything and <clears throat> skills are transferable i say this a lot you know people ask me what do you compete in because i'm very athletic and i have so many different modalities of movement and i would always just say life life is my sport right and so the things that i gain from sport are so transferable because I'm an artist as well, right? Yeah, and so, you know, to be a freelance artist is gnarly. It you is. Know? It's like, it's a whole, it's a beast. But my athletic, you know, I've been an athlete my whole life too. Mm. When I was younger, I was a competitive runner, but that stopped. And I had the dreams to go to the Olympics too, but that stopped when I started surfing and then it was just all about surfing. Mm. But, you know, I've been athletic my whole life. And now I'm really, it's almost like I've drawn back into my roots as a child. And you would think that I'm competing for something like it's my profession. But no, I just, you know, what I gain in, you know, my long runs and Brazilian jiu-jitsu and all the heavy weightlifting, all the things that I do, it applies to how I am as a career woman, as an entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. the resilience that I need to have, the adaptability, the agility all of it so and then i think what's also interesting um that really goes with what you're saying because i feel like it's it's more common to you're either the athlete or you are the artist right just to point out the two yeah yeah i mean that's like a human mindset you know the human mindset that's fear-based we have these default beliefs right default beliefs and the human mindset are those things that we believe to be true because we're human that we all think are true and sound right. right. And it really does sound right if you spend all your time doing one thing that you should be best at that mm-hmm. to devote time to something else is taking away from it. I mean, that sounds right, doesn't it? Right. Yeah, it just happens to be wrong. That's the only problem with it. <laughs> but yet we think that it's right, correct? Right. Yeah. And so we have this mythology, again, that we're running uphill against every day. Yeah. Especially even from the experts that are touting the same thing. So, again, I completely embrace what you say, and there's strong evidence for that. Yeah, you're living proof of it I mean, with all of your accomplishments. And, you know, did you, just as you're going through your life and as an athlete, as an artist, you would be leaning into both sides to kind of expand each side of yourself? Well, the way that I looked at it, I recognize that I could only do one thing so long every day and be effective at it. If mm-hmm. I continued to do it, I became ineffectual. I'm actually a hazard to myself. Oh. If I was creating a work of art, and when I started to get tired, if I got willful and stayed in the game, tried to make it better, mm-hmm. I'd ruin it every time. And if I was an athlete starting to get tired, and I felt like somebody else is training harder, my human mindset would keep me training longer than I get sick or injured. So there's an optimal time, and I realize, well, we have different compartments that make us up whether they're in our brain or wherever they reside, yeah. we're only effective maybe three hours at a specific subject matter at the very most, and then we go dull. That's so rather than you know spend another three hours at something being ineffectual, why don't we change what we're doing? Mm-hmm. Because that compartment that we're changing to hasn't been accessed to, so it's got a good three hours, and so you transfer to it, and you got a hugely productive three hours, while the other one starts to recover for tomorrow. And so I realized, so yeah, so I, you know, when I was practicing, uh, you know, my practice, I had, uh, you know, I'd work maybe five hours. Yeah. Then I'd go work on my art, you know, for maybe three, and then I'd go, you know, train for three. Yeah. And so I had, you know, 10, 12-hour day, but all of those were separate compartments that worked well together. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't tired because I didn't deplete one of the packets and didn't contaminate its recovery for the next day. And I found that... It only made me better, and I wish I didn't have to sleep so I could get something done and, you know, the stuff that goes along with that. Yeah, you were able to really uphold a lot of inspiration in all spaces, right? Because I trusted that, because I saw the evidence of it. The evidence was to work beyond fatigue or when you start to mentally soften, nothing Mm -hmm. good comes out of it. Right. Only frustration. Yeah. And, again, our human mindset, again, tricks us. It makes us think well, you know, you should be able to do this longer, or you're tired, mm-hmm. now is the time to stay in the game to develop an endurance against it. Right. And I, well, where did that come from? I mean, it's a great idea, but it doesn't deliver 
right you, you know yeah. in in real life and so again there are these mythologies that our human nature absorbs and adheres to because it does sound appropriate right and just but when you really look at the evidence of it it can't deliver sure and so that's part of the battle you know to recognize the unorthodox as being what it is when everybody else is swimming the other way right when evidence tells us that it's not you are someone who really needs to have proof right well i have to have an internal conviction okay about the potential okay and it's like i know what that feels like when i'm considering something and it's for real I, I, I know when it's true and when it's not true. Or maybe I know when I shouldn't take action on it and when I should. Yeah. And I may not always know the reason why, but I can definitely tell you how my perception of it is and what I'm experienced that tells me don't do it or do do it. This role. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and it's like I, I really trust that a lot. And it's, again, not because I'm indecisive to make an intellectual decision. Mm-hmm. But I found it at a certain point, the intellectual decision can't provide the nuances necessary and the certainty. There's something outside of that, that that can play part in the investigation of. But at the end of the day, to me and for me as a person, that there is an internal conviction. And I'm not saying it's not a hope that I want to manifest. Mm -hmm. It's a reality that is there that... I need to interpret as being take action or not take action. And I'm willing to be uh, receptive and respond to whichever that is. I, I, I'm kind of neutral in terms of my own ambition. Do you meditate? I do in my own way, yeah. In your own way, I love that. Well, yeah, I don't go blank, but yeah, I, no. I do connect yeah. at a very profound level and higher power yes. is really important to me. Do you journal? No. Really? The reason why I ask that, those are two of my you know, just methodology. I've been writing all my life and meditation has been a strong practice for me. Also not blank. It's actually very active and I'm communicating with my highest self. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's been going strong for almost 10 years now. Oh yeah. Great. I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm asking that is because I, I really do feel like, sure. I think I came downloaded with this deeper sense of self connection and the ability to be more self aware. But I can certainly say that those two things, especially writing, have really, really expanded. I can my see that. Yeah, yeah and I can you totally. are so self-aware and so yeah. self-connected. Because when you're saying this and how you kind of can go about making decisions, I feel like that is coming from someone who is very self-aware, I, and I self, know. self-connected. Yeah, so it's interesting actually that you don't journal. Or what can you? Please? Yeah, it's like well, I you know for some reason I don't know why this is, but my brain collates like a lightning speed. But my hands can't respond to put down on paper what I'm thinking fast enough to be accurate. Mm. It's I don't I know how, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I look at it and it's not what I was thinking. Yeah. And I don't know how to capture it, but I can hold in my mind what it is by putting a reminder, maybe pair or two or three words down that mm-hmm. recall the essence of it that I can fill in sure. when I see those words. I, I, I just, I'm a little bit baffled as why that is, but I know that's always been a, a situation yeah. for me where I don't understand why I can articulate it precisely, but I can't write it. It's just weird. There's just a gap between me and it and it's not emotional. It's just yeah. something that is. It's it's it awkward. Just is. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's so interesting. It's well, so it's, awkward. What's your morning like? I'm so curious. Yeah, well, I get up in the morning and the first thing I do is that um, I say a prayer. Okay. Where I acknowledge today as being an opportunity mm-hmm. to show up and be of influence and to be a good steward of revelation and insight. I ask for insight, you know, for my family, my daughter, and I, uh, you know, acknowledge uh, the presence of the universe as being a miraculous phenomena, and its majesty is mind-boggling. And I stand in reverence to the majesty of of the miracle. Then I'll have a glass of water. I do a, like a sixteen-eight uh, intermittent fasting, mm-hmm. so I have water, and then I'll have hot water with uh, some uh, ginger. And maybe some turmeric in it and a few other things and uh, 
I'm usually working by 5.30 or 6 after I've kind of gone through my ritual and of, you know, prayer and mm -hmm. connectedness and reverence. I really make it a point to be consciously aware of the day and it's an opportunity to advance certain things and to be given, you know, insight to step into that and to manifest that. It's really important to me. And then I'll uh, get in, usually into creative things. I'm really good with all my creativity in the morning mm -hmm. and I'll blast into those things. I'm always, you know, working on my program or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I have clients that are scheduled generally in the afternoon, depends on where they are. If they're uh, in Europe, then it, there, it would be some other time, yeah. maybe early in the morning, you know, yeah. six, seven, eight o'clock, just to be on. Uh, I talked with a guy today from the UK at uh, 7 a.m. Yeah. So it's like that. I, I ride my bike every day. You know, I go out and turn the pedals every day and you know, feel really good on the bike. And I'm a kinesthetic learner and I need to kind of get out and percolate and cogitate and, <laughs> you know, chew on things a little bit, yeah. you know, and kind of run them through a couple of times. And I ride generally by myself. And on days I, I ride hard, I, I ride hard. Days I ride easy, I ride really easy. Yeah. I never punish myself to an extent that I would not be able to recover for the next day. That's important. Yeah, for me, you know. Yeah. And I always have time for my family. I always connect with my daughter in the morning before she goes. And I'm faithful to my clients. I eat well. That works for me. Kind of a keto bent. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and cooking. And I'm always sort of experimenting with things. And, you know, I'm having a good time with that. Can you talk a little bit about... Because, you know, <clears throat> I was telling you before we started the podcast that, you know, I really... Black Belt Beauty, my lifestyle is really high high performance, but it's holistic high performance. So yes. it's really looking at everything from the whole picture. And that's why, you know, for me, I, I kind of see it as everything in life is just information. Really everything. Food, conversation, I mean everything. And it's I think what separates us is the kind of information that we choose to absorb. Mm -hmm. And then also the information that comes at us that maybe we didn't choose, but how we respond to it. And that's how I really kind of, this is my idea of what separates us as humans. Mm -hmm. But just to go into the value for you personally as such a high performer for mind and body, right? It's really one thing. The value of nutrition, the value of movement, you know, steadily mm -hmm. in life. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I think a fundamental side to this is to have uh, an understanding of what we can learn from nature and nature's design. And that's that you know, one of the hot topics is always we're going to 10x something or we're going to moonshot, you know, we're talking exponential. But what does that mean and how do we get there? And if we look at like nature, for example, when the parts of a system are optimized then they harmonize into a single system that makes exponential possible. I didn't say that all the parts have to be perfect. I said they have to optimize. So if we look at the systems of the body, you know, the body doesn't know it's made of systems. It only knows itself as one thing. You know, the anatomists have carved it up so we can learn it and study it, but that's not the reality of like what it is. And if we look to optimize the parts that make up our life, without chasing perfection because it's not necessary. You can't get the exponential by being perfect in one area and getting C in another. You can't get there. But if everything is like an 85 percenter or a 90 percenter, then everything goes exponential. And that's where the magic happens. And so I feel like our lives, if they're managed around that, and I also want to say that if you're going for symmetry in the system, that 85 or 90 percent where they're optimized, that that's not a compromise. Some people think it is, and they just can't live with it because their human nature won't let them go there. They just can't believe that 85% is enough, or they can't believe that more rest is going to help them recover and be stronger. They just can't go there. They just can't get outside the mythology. Yeah. You know, again, the recovery to effort and the symmetry is really important, and that's not a downgrade. You know, people think, well, we're harmonizing. I think harmonizing is a better word than balance. Balance sort of means that you're, I love that you, you know, said that. Yes. That, that you're sort of pounding down the high nails right. to an average, so everybody, right? You know, it's like no, that's not. The I don't way. even think there's such a thing. It's like harmony just feels better. Yes, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're they're harmophile. <laughs> yeah, I'm right there with you, man. Totally. Yeah, so I I think that that's really the target for us. Yeah. But being a choice to say that less is better to keep harmony and be okay with that mm -hmm. but to watch the human tendency to think that you're giving something up and you could be better 
if you stepped into it with more gas, which isn't true. That's a human nature yeah. response that's incorrect to longevity in like performance. Totally. I'm sure a lot of people listening right now are taking a deep breath, like, <laughs> breath. Yeah. Like, well, Cause it's so, and especially coming from you, you know, someone who is just, you validate, you, you are a high performer, you take people to the next level, organization. so to come from you to say, hey, that's actually false. It and is. Yeah, that's really important because, you know, I think <clears throat> most people think the opposite. They will do that. Well, that's the fear-based human nature. They're afraid yeah. that if they don't do it, they're going to lose something. Yeah. So naturally, the fear side of us will choose that option. Right. And it does seem real. Yeah. I mean, it really does seem real. Right. But in reality, if we look at the evidence, I mean, how many times have people gotten to a place where they're absolutely disgusted with themselves mm-hmm. and then they say, I quit. It's so And true. they take a month off, then they come back better than ever. Well, that should tell us something. You don't need to bury yourself to get better. Yes. It's a natural evolution of push and pause and knowing when to pull back, when in doubt, pause, don't push. I love that. You and know? I love that you say look to nature because that's something that I speak to a lot too because I'm like, the evidence surrounds us. It's, it is amazing. You just have to really be awake yeah. to see it, you know, absorb it and and really learn from mm-hmm. it. It's all right there. Mm-hmm. And so it is, it's a great teacher for mm-hmm. me as well. Yeah, me as well. Yeah. So that's amazing. I swear, I feel like you just put a lot of relief in people. <laughs> well, yeah, well, you know, it's, I've done it too many times the other way and you yeah. finally realize that, you know, there is mythology. Right. And it's like, why do we think like that? Right. Didn't work then. It's not going to work now. But yet it sounds so real. Yeah. Correct. If we come from our human nature, mm-hmm. that's our fear-based survival impulse that gets first dibs at every moment, yeah. that's the perfect alignment. Right. And we can't shut that off. Yeah. It has to be superseded by something. And we had, just have to apply that which keeps us moving forward without succumbing to the, you know, the myth. It's so helpful to hear this, too, because I would like to think that most people on this planet have a champion in them, regardless of... I think they do. Right? I absolutely. Like, you know, you don't have to be an athlete. You know, you just... Absolutely. We're all here performing, and, and that means essentially we're all here living, right? And there's mm-hmm. a performance in living. And so I feel like in that, there's also a, a potential champion that's living within us, and it's about accessing that champion right yes and i think that what's so great about your work is that you make it like i said earlier you make it possible you get like oh wow okay i can see this the human mindset the champion mindset i mean there's it feels like it's more attainable and i feel like people listening to this you know who maybe haven't considered the champion that lives within them will now start to investigate like well where is this champion in me right because yes yeah yeah well if we look at the skills that we have at our natural inclinations yeah that will tell us a lot right and if we look at what it is that we really want versus how we respond i think that's another contrast that will reveal to us what the other side is i think we do know what we want yeah but the pull of human nature is generally stronger because it gets first dibs Mm -hmm. and it's yet that which is put out there by you know media and all this other stuff yeah that can't take us to where we want to go it's not possible because it's not calibrated to do that right i helped a guy win a gold medal here at the olympics i said look you know like you think you got to be perfect to win Mm -hmm. and i said that's complete mythology you know your brain has tricked you into thinking that perfect jump equals gold medal and that sounds right to the mind, but to the person that has experience, it's not about that. It's being appropriately prepared enough, having a good warm up, mm-hmm. and knowing what to do when and executing on that. Yeah. Right. Again, there's so much mythology. Yeah. And our truth is based upon which mindset we're deferring to because they're, again, vying for control over our decision making right there will be things that make sense Mm -hmm. to the human mindset that have not proven themselves one bit to deliver human mindset people given an opportunity the first thing they're going to ask is what do i stand to lose Mm -hmm. you'd never see a champion do that they would ask what do i stand to gain two completely different universes totally (laughs) given an opportunity human nature well i'm doing my best you know, they've already decided what it is in advance without even trying. Yeah. It's like a false ceiling that they've already talked themselves into totally. without any challenge against 
the assumption or the champions, well, you may be doing your best, but I'll find a way. I mean, why do you think I'm given creativity? Why do you think I'm given curiosity? Yeah. Why am I right. given this? Right. Well, it's to find a way. So again, I think it's a matter of really understanding our biology because this is hardwired into us. Totally. It's not an aberration of psychology, in my opinion, or a socialization. You travel the world and people are incredibly predictable. <laughs> if you see this, this is going to happen. Right. It's so predictable. Yeah. This is chapter four, actually, in my program, by the way, Mindset. It's all about this. Mindset for me is everything. So one of my hashtags on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> You're hoarding it. <laughs> is train the mind. Well, no. And the reason yeah. for that is because... You know, people always want to know, like, how do you stay so disciplined? How do you stay so motivated? I'm like, if I really am trying to, like, okay, let me dissect, let me get into myself. Everything for me starts in the mind. And I do operate from a very empowered mindset, which I feel is so aligned with the champion yes. mindset, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. You know? And so, anyways, I love just the word mindset is just so powerful. Chapter four. One thing that I would love to know, because you're so strong-minded, I would like to know what are some of the greatest or one if even to point out one single thing what's one of the greatest pivots mental challenges that you pivoted from in your life that allowed you to propel yourself further into this fuller expression of yourself well one skill that i've always had is that when i see a change has to be made i'm fearless i step into change immediately okay. i don't try to hang on to something that's outlived its shelf life like, for example, I was you know working on my program in its early inception, and it was the Champions uh, Blueprint, which it really was. It showed the whole process in explicit detail, but it was too broad in a sense that people that had success wanted to develop legacy. People that didn't have success wanted to achieve goals. Two different aspirations, and having a single entity that address both simultaneously wouldn't work because they're two different populations. Yeah. So I realized immediately that I'm going to go with the goal achievement roadmap first. And so I went home that day. I saw that this is what had to happen. Boom. Conversion happens right now because there's no future in it right. the way it is. So let's just do that. So I've always been able to stop something immediately and divert to the course of action that's revealed itself as being that you know prudent path to be able to move forward that's one i also pivotal moments uh you know for sure when we adopted our daughter 10 years ago at the age of 10 i was 58 when we adopted her a 10 year old from columbia at the age of 10 i incredible to, to say the least i mean she didn't speak english we didn't speak spanish really she came from a life of terror murder prostitution drugs the gritty streets and you know social jungle you know of rural Columbia and the raw substrate was no school, no language, ADHD, PTSD from all the abuses of which all of them were there and uh, severe malnutrition, a parasitic ridden body, every risk factor known to humanity at 20 on a scale of 10. Uh, it was formidable to address that. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to save a life, but it's another thing to be an active participant in crafting in helping usher a person away from that which she didn't ask for mm -hmm. to be able to step into what she's capable of manifesting. That's a whole other conversation. And it was uh, full time for my wife and myself to uh, raise our daughter for the last 10 years. And she's now in college. So that would for sure be the biggest thing ever because um, when you're dealing with that and what I'll say about her, what a, what a hero she is to come from that, yeah. to give up a family, a country, her name, right? virtually everything to have a chance at next, not even know what next is. I mean, she thought the lights of an airplane in the sky were shooting stars. She didn't know that there were airplanes oh at 10. Can you imagine that? Yeah, that's no amazing. toilet, no warm, never been in an elevator. Never, I mean, oh, wow. seriously. Wow. And so the scaling was just incredibly lopsided that required a lot of dexterity sure. to be able to negotiate, you know, moment by moment to help usher her forward at the correct pace to catch up. Yeah. That required a staff of a thousand people to really step into it. But you know, and also acknowledge her ability to adjust to a complete upside down exposure to her reality. Mm -hmm 
but her reality couldn't take her beyond where she was because the opportunities had already exhausted themselves at 10. And so there was only kind of one way out, so to speak. And, you know, you're not trying to make the child the uh, manifestation of, you know, you or the you that you wanted to be. It's right. like, well, what do we need to do to nurture the best in her for her sake and honor that? And so for me, that was the highest pivotal moment. I, you know, I mean, my wife cried. She cried every day for nine years and nine months. It was that difficult. That's incredible. It was that difficult. And most people give the kid back after a year because they can't handle the deceit, the lying, the cheating, the, the just yeah. the complete disregard for human decency. Right. And it's so disruptive to the relationship. Then, the, you know, the, the adoptive parents can get divorced because it's so destructive. Yeah. But the, the reason why I bring this up is that... Um, Pivotal moments. I mean, this was a huge pivotal moment. Not easy either. That, I mean, the challenge that you oh, to say the least work through. Yeah. To do this in the best possible way for her, for all of you, really. Right. That's yeah. Yeah. Would you say that that's been one of the greatest challenge? That is the greatest challenge. Well, it's been? the greatest challenge and the accomplishment yeah. to, or, or the thing that I'm most passionate about that I would defend forever because. You know, for us to, to step into this in a way that it deserved to be stepped into. I mean, mm -hmm. we're not half parents or quarter parents or, you know, again, our deal was you come live with us. We're your parents. Right. Parents means all in. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean being selective, at least in our vocabulary. And so with her, yes, it was very difficult. But I mean, quite honestly, there's something in every one of us that need some mechanism to get the best out of us and when life is too good nobody changes people actually get a little bit more whiny about stuff and so i think that you know everybody has a rite of passage where they're called to something and usually it's a uh, unrelenting challenge that you can't it's not like a bad day you can sleep it off and get up the next day no problem but no you're saddled with this for forever yeah. and there's only one way to do it and that's to get it right at least in you know my opinion and what is right you know you have to struggle to find out what that is as well so again for us it, best thing ever i can say that after 10 years and now looking back because the challenges the worst and the most difficult are over mm -hmm. and doesn't mean we're at the bottom of the barrel you know there's always uncertainties but you know to really say that you know we all need a rite of passage to have a certain sobriety that forces us to ask a deeper set of questions that we would never ask if life is too good like all the time. And we always come out the other side a much better person. It doesn't feel like it at the time. And so in this instance, uh, I'm eternally thankful for it because of the opportunity. And she's a great kid. She's beautiful. She's That's a great kid. Yeah, she's she's a great kid. Thank you. Yeah. What's your favorite part about being a father? I will say that if you ever doubt the value of what you say or how you show up and what you do and how your sheer presence speaks to everybody in proximity, adopt a kid. Because they hang on your every word. I mean, she used to hang on to me, wrap her you know, legs around my waist and just nuzzle up to me. She'd never been hugged. Yeah. And so, I mean, we have that opportunity like every day to decide how we're going to show up for other people. And I just feel like you know, we have the privilege of having an opportunity through this dimension mm -hmm. and that we need to step into it. And part of the way we do that is that we show up for other people from our champion self and we call them to a higher game through our example and through our encouragement. And those things that are difficult for us, we, in the privacy of our own life experience, we find a way through that. Yeah. You know, we don't make that part of the deal of our engagement like with other people. It's part of our therapy mm -hmm. in a certain sense and it creates a level of discipline that we need to have and some people may say well you know you're not being authentic because you're not sharing with other people your disappointment and how difficult it is it's like i don't think that has anything to do with it it's like i think yeah. that you know on this is that you know to me the sniveling self is the human self i don't want to be human in that respect i, so I want to be you know i want to come from my champion self to me that's the expression of that and that's what people deserve you know, I love that you said this because I, in a recent podcast, I was talking about vulnerability and I'm an extremely vulnerable woman. I actually feel like my <coughs> vulnerability is a stepping stone to my strength. Yeah. They really go hand in hand. But in this particular podcast, I was talking about, you know, I don't mind sharing moments of vulnerability, but you're, I'm not the one that you're going to see. This is a common thing now that you see on social media a lot too. It's like, yeah. The disclosure. 
Oh my goodness. Like where you get a free pass for the full disclosure. Oh, like there's literally yeah. crying and the, and I'm not putting that down. But yeah, of course. I, it, what I said is, listen, I operate from a very empowered mindset. So even as I work through challenge and difficult things in my life, how I am going to share to you is from this mindset. Yeah. And this mindset says, okay, yeah, you know what? Fuck, this is hard, but I got it. And it's yeah. not me pushing away or suppressing the pain even. the ch- I'm on my knees sometimes. I'm crying. But I still am going through it with this, but I got it, just to make it kind of simple. To, and I feel like that's just, I that's love it, man. what you just said. Well, thank you. I just do believe that we need to be a, a hope, a beacon of hope and sanity and courage in today's world by showing up in a way that empowers people people to step up yes to give their best and it's like look you don't have to be the best to show up the best we're all kind of a work in progress finding our way forward right yes and while we're sort of working on that journey internally within ourselves, we show up and to me our authentic self is the one that transcends the other self that's working it out and that we're expressing that in a way that does call people to a higher game and gives them an alternative while we're working ourselves out and we're not giving ourselves a free pass by doing that we're just saying that there are two different things that we need to make sure that we're clear that they're not the same thing yes. and how we do show up does make a difference and that's had people shown up different for my daughter she wouldn't have the challenges that she has right but yet they did and she didn't ask for that and now she has to unravel that and unscramble that mm-hmm. And I kind of feel like we don't have the right to impose any of our stuff on anybody else. Life's hard enough as it is. Sure. More than zero people in a room is trouble. Right. Yeah, it's sort of the way it is. So, again, I, I feel like in the morning, a couple of rituals I'll share with you that we talked about morning rituals. We got started on that. But, you know, every morning before I get started on the work day, I always uh, decide two things. I look at why I'm doing this and I see a picture of my wife, my daughter. And I have a picture that's of a silhouette of people, you know, because I I do it for them. Because I do feel that, you know, we need to step into other people's lives by demonstrating the best that we can be, not to showcase ourselves, but to show other people what's possible and also to decide how we're going to show up. I think that's the most valuable question that we should always ask. So those are a couple of rituals I just wanted to share with you. I love that. And I agree with you. And I'm... My mornings are very, they're beautiful. And I am always, you know, really priming my mind and setting my intention and and deciding. And I love asking myself questions that allow me to really prime my mind and essentially focus in that direction as well. You know, I think something that just came to me as you were saying that is, you know, you really are someone who has lived and continues to live with not just passion, but with purpose, with vision, you know, and that. It, purpose I mean that's that's a big word it is a big word yeah and I, I think that it's so rich right and it's obvious that that's something that you have been and continue to be not just living with but you're fueled by that's true yeah and that's deliberate I think we need to cultivate that you know my definition of purpose purpose is actually the outcome for step number three in the program which is impact because when we understand the impact of our goals by vetting them, mm-hmm. it gives us purpose, which is a, a core conviction to pursue and achieve a goal. Meaning that there's something that transcends us that we'll fight for to make sure that it manifests. And I do think that we do need to create that structure into Absolutely. our life. And another thing I'd like to say, if I could, is just, Please. you know, my daughter, to say that it was difficult for us, but also difficult for her. You know, Tarzan doesn't want to be domesticated. And that's kind of what was being asked of her. No structure, kid of the streets now to jump into structure. I can only say again that never doubt anything that you say or anything that you do because the impact of that is significant. Let's not decide what that is. Let's let the product, how people respond, kind of validate that and just come from my highest self. And you know, for her, her light bulb's on she's bright you know she's completely on fire in school right now and you know my wife has played an immensely important role in uh, being of assistance to be her rock to care enough about her to not dismiss things and uh, i'll just share with you three things that i told my daughter she could barely understand english but i said number one 
is that I'm never going to let you down. Whatever I say I'm going to do, I'm going to do. Number two is that you're always going to have enough to eat. Number three, you got to earn your place on the team. If anybody deserves a free pass, it's you. But it's not going to serve you well. You got to earn your place in the starting lineup. And that's kind of been how we've engaged our daughter. And I can only say that we're not showcasing us, we're really showcasing her. And that people are capable of amazing things if they're given the support, the tools, and the knowledge to be able to be given permission and take the permission to consider big and what it is that they really want. And then if you have a map that you can follow that tells you where you are and what to do, what's behind that maybe you need to catch up on before you move forward and what's coming. Yeah. So you avoid the preventable problems and seize the best opportunities. Then you do kind of have a chance to learn the primal skill, you know, which to me is goal achievement. That's beautiful. I can't wait to meet your daughter. And She's just, a great kid. Yeah. Well, I feel like, wow, she, you know, I'm going to just go through. It's like, wow how fortunate for her to gain you both as parents but right next to that thought is but how fortunate for you both to no gain, question right it's no like no it, question it all it's like it's right it's no question yeah what a unit and how you guys are able to learn from each other and grow from each other and that in of itself and of all the things incredible things that you've already accomplished and created in your life i mean this is rich this is wealth it's the crowning achievement yeah I mean, for sure. There's got to be a balance sheet that makes sense out of all of this. And <laughs> I mean, in a certain way, you know, and yeah. I mean, kids really do that. And again, without the challenge, if life's too easy, there's no reason to ask a deeper set of questions that really do have to be asked to tease out that which is within us that's begging to get out and find a place in our lives. We may not know that at the time because it can be painful. It could be terrifying or whatever but we kind of need that you know in a certain sense and as far as i could tell nobody's exempt from that and so when it shows up i think we need to recognize that for what it is and if we have a method and we have some appropriate support to help us through that it can be one of the most transformative periods of our life ever yeah Mm. i'm like can i high five you please yeah absolutely high five it (laughs) everybody hear that that was the real deal (laughs) That was a real deal. I'm so elevated. Yeah. Okay, I have some. Um, well, I have some fun kind of rapid words that I like to ask my guests. Yeah, um, perfect. Before I do that, is there anything that you haven't expressed? There's so much to you, and I'm so grateful for all that you've already shared. Um, but if there's anything that you haven't said yet that you would like to put into this episode, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, at first, there's always room at the top for the best. Always. Where it's crowded is down with everybody else, you know. Um, and I would also say that there's 7 billion people on this planet right now, and there's only one of us, but only one of us in all of creation. And that really empowers us with some unique opportunities to cultivate and grow our uniqueness and create a life based on that without comparison to become our own champion in those areas that are important to us. When we do that and we take stock of that, it changes the game significantly. So I would just suggest and and hope that everybody would really think about that. Like, what are my assets? I get one pass through this dimension and there's only one of me in all of creation, which is like one in 350 billion, if you look at all the people. Right. But yet there's us and there's only one of us. We're not insignificant how we show up, what we say, the presence of our being, our electromagnetic signature without a word being spoken, that's speaking to people, Mm -hmm. our aspirations, our encouragements, our how we honor life's privilege. I mean, those are all like really important things to me. And there's got to be a reconciliation in life at some point about, you know, what's our scorecard here? How do we look at the value that we've derived or you know that we've contributed and i'll just say that there are different stages of lifespan development that we kind of have to go through and there are no exemptions or free passes from that and i would just say that 
we can't be in a hurry to try to evolve and mature faster than we can do it because there are certain things that are age appropriate. You know, we do kind of need to be considerate of that, but simultaneously looking at, you know, building our skills that give us the freedom to create a life that we determine and we execute and we create for ourselves and decide how you're going to show up each and every day. I think those are really the, the keys to that and to uh, honor the privilege and, you know, take it real seriously. Totally. You know, and also the legacy part of it. You know, people think, well, you know, I'm here and then I'm gone. Well, hold on a second. You're here, but you know what you did kind of lives on. And there will be a statement about what we do with our time and our talents that will be on public display for all of eternity for people to look at what we did with ourselves. And I think it's a good idea, not too prematurely, but at a certain point when that occurs to a person to Mm -hmm. start to consider like the creation of that. Absolutely. I love that. That's yeah. so perfect. I mean, just, yes, to think about legacy, but I love that you also say not prematurely necessarily. Right. You don't have to get wrapped. It, it comes at the right time. and I, It I, does. I really do feel that in my <clears throat> own life. It is Beautiful. something that I'm thinking about at 41 and have been thinking about for some time, but, you know, wasn't necessarily thinking about legacy when I was 18, but... It's right. <laughs> Right. I, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to that it's later. It's a beautiful seed to plant, you know? Yeah, all so beautiful, everything that you just put out. I'm someone who I love to take time to process, you mm-hmm. know? I'm a deep thinker, and so I myself will be listening to this episode over and over again. Well, give me an update. <laughs> I will for sure. Okay, so some fun words. Um, and it's, you know, no competition here, Jack. <laughs> Well, it's not exactly like I'm it. competitive or anything. No, not at all. As I tell my wife, I you know I'm, I have no problem with losing as long as it's not me. You know, <laughs> it's, it's perfectly okay. I'm telling you right now, the closest people in my life are all obsessed with winning. It's a beautiful <laughs> obsession. I love it so much. All different walks of life, career life, but yeah, we all have this thing about winning. Um, so the the words are just you know what they kind of um, how they impact you. Yeah. First word is fear. Fear, you know, we all have it. We should take action despite it. We shouldn't wait for it to dissipate to take action. You do that which has to go right when it needs to go right. Boom. Love. Love. I think of our daughter first and foremost. She can love anybody. You just do it. You don't need a special uh, set of circumstances. You step into it and you extend it unconditionally. Love that. Challenge. It's a good thing because it will help us access our talents and also give us deep appreciation for what our gifts uh, and the privilege of possibility. Creativity. An essential daily nutrient. <laughs> oh, I felt that one in my heart right now. <laughs> oh, that's so good. It's so good. Passion. Passion. You got to have it. There's never enough of it. Surrender. The most important, best lessons can come from surrender. You know, when you stop trying, that's oftentimes when all the good stuff happens. You won. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that was surprised. I, <laughs> I'm at a loss for words. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Thank you so, so my much. My pleasure. Thank you. Can you please let our listeners know how to keep up with you, how to look more into your work, your programs? Thank you. Yes. Well, the first place to go actually is uh, www.drjeffspencer.com, like D-R-G-E-F-F-S-P-E-N-C-E-R.com, forward slash roadmap experience. And if they go there, there is a 42-minute video where I share with people the basic fundamental components of and the functions of the Goal Achievement Roadmap experience and the roadmap itself. It's a great place to get an introduction to it. And there's also more information if you're interested in other levels of involvement. Amazing. That would be first and foremost. My website is drjeffspencer.com. There's always sorts of goodies there. Please go there and put in your name to get the free gift. The free gift is actually a white paper that I wrote called How Not to Blow It Just Before You Win. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) So that's a really good paper that you want to look at before you need to read it. Yes. And then the other thing is to drop me a line, Jeff at drjeffspencer.com, because I've got a couple things cooking here. i got the Champions Club that I'm 
assembling for those people that want to play a much bigger game, that want to be part of a group that gets together that's facilitated by me. It's time for that. If you're interested, please extend an email to me and uh, we can even schedule a call to have a chat about it because uh, enrollment is now happening. It's going to be closed at 12 people. Okay. And registration is now open. So those are the, the three things. Uh, I also do a uh, one-on-one or one-to-team advisory and you can contact me through my email address for details about that one-on-one uh, coaching, corner man coaching. If you have an organization or a group that you would like me to present to or to do a workshop with. That's something that I'm available for. Again, Jeff at drjeffspencer.com. Stay tuned. You know, more chapters to be written. I have no doubt. <laughs> well, Let me ask you this. I got yes. one more sneak question. Ooh, I, I now I'm say. excited. What's one thing that you would like to add to your legacy that you have not created or accomplished yet? I'll say two things if I can. I mean, for me, for me personally, I'd love to take a, a ride in F-16. Okay. An airplane. I, I would like to do that. That's a bucket list item for me personally. But I think on the personal side, what's really important to me is family. I love my family. And I want to stay close. I want to get closer. I want to share life's experiences with us. I want it to showcase to other people what's possible. I know I got a bunch of books in me and other things as well, but top of mind, I, I would really like to be able to share my knowledge because I kind of really get how all this works. Yeah, you do. And it's not quite what people think it is or the real story hasn't really been told that I would like to share with people. So please, for those that are interested, you know, please get on my mailing list and uh, you'll be notified of how it is that I'm working to achieve that. That's amazing. Yeah, all of the information you just gave will be in the show notes. So all Great. of you guys Beautiful. Can go Thank right you. there. Thanks, follow. everybody. Yeah, thank you so much, not just for your time and your agility with me, but for being such an incredible contributor to this life that we are all living. I think it's beautiful. It's so important. Well, that's very generous and thoughtful for you to say. And, you know, I'm, I'm sharing my experience as it's been lived. And again, I think that, you know, that's something that we all need to do for each other and why we need to create a life of meaning, value and contribution so that the ripple effect with only half a degree of separation between us and everybody has a dramatic impact. So thanks again for the amazing privilege. It meant a lot to me. Thank you. All right, you guys, catch you in the next one. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode, you guys. If you loved it, please share it on your social. Throw it up on your Instagram stories and tag me. I'm at Black Belt Beauty. I am also at Roxy Look, R-O-X-Y-L-O-O-K. I love connecting with you guys. This is a conversation that I want to just continue growing with you guys. So if you feel inspired to hit me up, do so in that space. I always enjoy hearing from you. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by rating it and reviewing it via iTunes. It's such supportive help, you guys. It really helps the visibility of this podcast. So I appreciate and thank you in advance for doing that. And last but not least, if you are interested in starting your own podcast, or perhaps you already have one and you need help with, you know, editing your audio and the production of it, I cannot recommend my producers enough. Resonate Recordings, you guys, they are the bomb. I rely on them. They are an absolute supportive tool to me and my podcast. So check them out and let them know that Black Belt Beauty sent you. And on that note, you guys, I'm signing off with all my love and always looking forward to catching you on the next.